My name is Michael Livingston. I was raised on Cold Bay on the Alaska Peninsula. And the first uh, formal alley class I took was alley basket weaving uh, during my first year of high school. And that was at Kodiak Island. And the instructor was Amphesia Shapsnikov, who was a, a fine alley basket weaver. Uh, Amphesia was very, very passionate about, about teaching and learning and preserving and uh, rejuvenating ancient alley ways. And, and in a sense, I think that's kind of where my first real deep interest in ancient alley ways occurred. Between 13 and 21, I continued to be really, really interested in ancient alley ways. I, I went to college in Minnesota and um, uh, somehow ended up uh, having a major in French. I ended up over living in France and learning about the French culture and the language and, and the history and the art. And I was, I was sitting over in France and saying, Mike, you, at this point in your life, you know more about the French culture than you do about your own Aleut culture. And um, I returned to my campus in Minnesota and asked around, is there, do you have a program, in, for example, in anthropology that focuses in Aleut studies? And of course, they didn't there in Minnesota. And, uh, I ended up returning to, to Alaska, spending time with my mother, meeting with my grandmother, and trying to learn what I could um, from my own family about, about the ancient uh, Aleut culture. And then uh, when I was about 21, I took an Aleut uh, Baidarka class at an Alaska, and that was instructed by Sergei Savorov of Nikolsky. And that's when I started getting interested in uh, some of the other aspects of ancient Aleut lifestyle, such as um, how to build the kayak, how to cover it, how to make the paddle, how to make the bent wood hat. And, um, and then in the late 1990s, when the Alaska Native Heritage Center opened, they asked me to make a bidarka, and I made a one-hatch uh, kayak uh, in 1999, the very first year that the Alaska Native Heritage Center opened. And um, then towards the end of 1999, they started um, having the kayaks and canoe project um, they asked me to submit a proposal for building a two-hatch uh, kayak, an uluhta. And during that uh, project, um, in addition to building a two-hatch kayak, um, my team also built uh, two kayak paddles, two chagudha, two Ali Benwood hats. And, um, and since then, I basically have been teaching uh, kayak building at different Ali culture camps, um, uh, St. Paul and the Pribilof Islands, St. George, um, in the Alaska Peninsula, Cold Bay, King Cove, Chignik, uh, in the Shumagan Island, Sandpoint, uh, uh, the Aleutian Islands, Unalaska, and uh, Akatan. And over the course of that time, I've attended some classes from Patty Gregory and uh, other instructors. And um, so, yeah, in a nutshell, that's basically where I started learning about uh, building hats. To this day, I, I cherish my time that I was able to spend both with Amphesia Shapsnikov and Sergei Savorov, and I do try to, to recognize all that I learned from them and, and what they shared with me. If we know Aleut history, there was many thousand years of the culture of the people living in the Aleutian Islands and the Alaska Peninsula. Then the Russians arrived, and basically knowledge about the ancient ways plummeted. The population dramatically declined. The number of, of ikiaks, of, of traditional kayaks, declined until it was around zero in the mid-1900s. Um, the number of sea otter declined. And a lot of that information was, was basically lost. And I think, in a sense, also, particularly in the 1900s, after decades of being humiliated and uh, basically enslaved by the Russians, followed by um, decades of, of um, mockery from United States school teachers and other officials, interest in those ancient ways had basically hit rock bottom. Uh, but then towards the late, late 1900s, interest uh, in ancient Aleut ways started to increase, and um, more people wanted to learn how to make the Bentwood hats, more people wanted to learn how to make the kayaks. To, to make a kayak yourself, to put together the frame, to, to skin it and put a waterproof skin on it, and to uh, carve your bentwood hat and to put on your hat and to, to paddle that out in the ocean like the ancestors did. That's, 
that's kind of for many Aleuts the ultimate experience to, to try to learn what it was like, uh, the lifestyle of our ancient ancestors. The traditional kayak covered with skin, with sea lion skin, tends to be more flexible and you tend to be more in touch with nature because there's only a, a thin layer of skin between you and the ocean. But when you've got a traditional parka on, traditional rain gut uh, jacket, and a bent wood hat, and a, you're holding a wooden paddle, uh, it's, it's really just a, a different feeling that's kind of hard to describe, but, um, but it's, if you, it's as if you've traveled back in time and you're getting closer to walking within the ancient people. It was about the year 2000, I was up in the Pribilof Islands. Um, I was in a, a Baidarka, but I didn't have a Bentwood hat on. And uh, we were over by um, Tolstoy Point, and there's a Northern Fur Seal rookery there. So as we paddled out amongst the Northern Fur Seal, um, th they would come up quite closely. And you'd be paddling along and you'd see one come up over here and you'd be naturally tempted to, to turn and look at the uh, northern fur seal. But the instant your eyes made contact with the eyes of the, the fur seal, the fur seal would, would dive. And um, so, but other times when I've been wearing a bentwood hat, it, it tends to, to shield your eyes and make it much more difficult to see. And while wearing a bentwood hat, the animals tend to tend to come more, much more closely. Um, one other time when I was paddling a Baidarka um, at St. Paul Island, um, I had on a, a hat, a Bentwood hat, and the fur seals weren't scared of me. You know, they were curious. They would come right up to you. One northern fur seal at the bow of my kayak uh, came out and uh, based, uh, briefly touched uh, his teeth to the bow of the kayak and then went back into the water. And uh, yeah, there's, you can definitely start to feel some of the, the almost magical power of the Bentwood hats in terms of how they were designed and what some of their functions were. Today we typically use steel tools and we typically use lumber that we're able to purchase commercially. For example, the wood for this project came from a, a mill in Wasilla, Poppert Mill. At the same time, uh, we try to go backwards in time and try to learn uh, ancient woodworking techniques that the old time Aleuts might have used. And one way of, of learning that is to attend an archaeology dig. Um, and I've been on archaeology digs in the Pribilof Islands and, and the Alaska Peninsula and, and uh, on archaeology surveys in the Aleutian Islands. Yeah, we are basically just beginning this process. Uh, um, as we're moving forward in time, we're also moving back in time, and it would be nice to continue to, to do more basically what we might call experimental archaeology on the beach uh, in terms of splitting the wood, in terms of working with the stone and the bone tools, and uh, learning more about how the old timers did it. And through that process, I think we can continue to, to not only increase our skill level, but also increase our appreciation of, uh, of what, the, what people did for thousands of years in the Aleutian Islands. Today, most of us um, are really amateurs, whether we're talking about bentwood hat carvers or kayak builders. Uh, we're not really the true experts that the ancient Aleuts were. They knew how to carve bentwood hats to use the spiritual rituals based upon generation after generation of, of building and then generations of field testing, taking the kayaks out into the ocean, wearing the hats out on the kayaks. And they were really true experts. Um, and uh, today, uh, I think even the finest of us kayak builders are still amateurs. but. We get done what we can, and uh, when you take the time to look at some of the old Bentwood hats or some of the old kayaks, you get a, a true appreciation. Not only did they build them functionally, but they also built them very, very artistically, and uh, they were basically just using stone and bone and, and wood tools, and so your appreciation of, of the old timers really increases dramatically. 
Well, having the opportunity to look at a, a real hat, one that was made by an old timer, you know, dozens or hundreds of years ago is a, is a really great opportunity because when you can actually see the hat and you can see the amount of pride and workmanship that went into the hat, you can uh, learn techniques on how it was made. Um, that's, that's a really amazing opportunity. And uh, seeing how excited the other Bentwood hat carvers are. Um, and when you're with a, a group of other Bentwood hat carvers, one person will see something that you didn't see and you'll see something that, that they didn't see. And it's, it's really a great opportunity to to get inspired uh, by the work uh, that um, the ancient people did. When we looked at the old wooden hat, there was a lot of things that we really couldn't make sense of, that um, in terms of how they were able to get it to bend so nicely, uh, how they were able to get the back of it nicely formed. There was one strip of wood along the back edge of the hat that, uh, that kept the roundness of the back of the hat. It might have raised more, more questions than answers, but it's a great opportunity for all of us to sit together and brainstorm and to experiment and try this and try that. One example is on, on the back of the old time hat, the wood flared out, it got thicker. And that's not something that you'd see us typically do today. We might just start with a flat piece of wood and not take the time to build the thick, thickness on the, on the back of that ridge. So. So yeah, there's lots of, lots of mysteries. It's like a big puzzle with all the parts scattered around the world and uh, we're trying to draw those pieces back in to our culture to, to uh, better understand what the ancient ways were like. When some people look at an Aleut hat, they just see a wooden hat and it doesn't make any sense to them. But for the ancient Aleut people, the hats had tremendous amounts of symbolism to them. They were spiritually strong. They um, gave strength and, and power to a kayaker. Uh, and again, if you've ever been in a kayak, whether it's a plastic kayak or a traditional wood on frame, uh, skin, uh, skin on skeleton kayak, uh, when you're out in the ocean, uh, the ocean is quite large and, and uh, your kayak is quite small. And if you're going out into areas where there's things that are larger than you, uh, seals, sea lions, or whales, you tend to feel pretty vulnerable. And uh, you can start to understand why um, having something that's spiritually strong, having a hat to help protect you, um, can start to, to give you strength and give you um, a lack of fear, a fearless type of feeling. So um, these, these hats were very, very important to the ancient Aleut people and uh, the spirituality that's built into them, um, the pride, the, the elevation of social status, um, all of those uh, start to uh, start, when you've built them, built, carved your own hat and started to wear it in a kayak, then's when you start to uh, gain that deeper level of understanding. Well, this program, this residency has really been a wonderful opportunity to uh, see some of the excitement within the community when the uh, school children come by and uh, start, we do our presentation to them. They ask, the students ask the questions. You can see sometimes a spark in the youngsters' eyes to where uh, it's clear that they're really excited about what's going on. And uh, it's, it's clear that the project has started to uh, create interest in them about their own culture. Uh, some of the students aren't Aleut, uh, they might be Yupik, but by them coming and looking at the hat project, the Aleut hat project that we're working on, uh, you can really uh, see that uh, it's really cool that they are, are become genuinely interested in, in for example, the, the old Yupik ways. If you kind of look at indigenous people worldwide, um, and you know whether it's in the North American continent or Australia or New Zealand, um, a lot of the indigenous populations have been st struggling with issues about self-esteem. Uh, self, the self-esteem of the of in the old times I think was really high, but after colonization, um, globally, 
the self-esteem of people of indigenous people declined. But I think it's through the process of of learning a bit more um, in terms of the art, in terms of the woodworking, um, in terms of the survival techniques. I think that can be a tremendous pool of of rebuilding self-esteem to help. Um, particularly youth who, who struggle with some of these issues um, can, can help make people feel better about themselves, can f make them feel that, that they are able to accomplish things, that they are able to endure the difficult times. I'd like to see more projects like this project that we're working here at the Anchorage Museum with the Smithsonian Arctic Studies Center, the opportunity for um, artists and apprentices to get together and to learn some amazing skills and uh, to, to network with the community. And uh, it, uh, it would be good to see um, long-term projects continued. Um, as educators today, I think that we need to find techniques for uh, putting our instruction online, developing online classes to where um, not only do we show a global audience how you build a hat, but if they need some help, um, we find techniques for providing them that help. And Fisha Shapsnikov le left some exhortations, and one of her exhortations was get together from time to time. Uh, you know, even if it's just before the, the season's holiday and when you want to make some gifts, uh, get together on a fairly regular basis and, and do stuff and uh, talk about talk the old language and talk about uh, the old stuff. So it'd be good to, to follow some of Amphesia's advice and uh, continue this onward into the future.